Attention duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Rescheduled Doomsday, Cannibal Couple, and Cult Music. Plus this day in history with the Omaha Race Riots and our Song of the Day by Probably Not on your Morning Monarchy for September 28th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are for another blast of listener-supported media. We have been brought to you by you since 9-11-05, 12 plus years and counting of independent non-commercial alternative media. You know, I ran Media Monarchy as my side thing, side hustle as the kids like to say, for a decade. And then just about two years ago, I quit my commercial FM radio job because I wanted to work for you, and I love it. And a huge thanks for your support. MediaMonarchy.com slash support has the PayPal, the Patreon, and also the cryptocurrencies and a little bit of post office box as well. So if you don't do any of those cryptocurrencies or PayPal or Patreon, you can just send your thanks in the post. And a huge thanks to you. We also enjoy records and cookies and those sorts of things as well. We are streaming live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen about a minute after 9 a.m. on Thursday morning. And it's a holy hexes day. Each day of the week, we focus in on a different area of the news, and Thursdays are not safe for work. Very dark. Typically speaking, media monarchy is always for adults, but Thursday is the pretty gross underbelly. The occult mayhem. All the madness. All the murder and mayhem and madness that you can find using hashtag holy hexes. And all the stories that we're going to talk about, you can find at the top of the tweets, just like you can find the invite to the chat in Discord. You can also listen in Discord. You can find all those links at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Cash demand soars in Puerto Rico after hurricane hits ATMs and card systems. What? You mean a cashless setup is not a good idea? You might need some physical assets? Yes. In Puerto Rico, relying on luck and enough gas to get medical care. Trump tax plan sends dollar and bond yields higher and miracles really do happen. Representative Steve Scalise returns to Congress 15 weeks after being shot on a baseball field. Now, one of the more conspiratorial sites that I read, In Search of Black Assassins by a guy named Prince Ray. Holy moly, crazy. He talks about different scenarios of the Steve Scalise shooting and brings in a character called Party Crasher, a quote-unquote secret service agent. It's been at all the pivotal moments. Stabbed Christ in the side. (sighs) R.I.P. Hugh Hefner. Playboy creator, dead at the age of 91. Not a bad run for Hugh Hefner. Supreme Court set to deal sharp blow to unions for teachers and public employees. And reality winner, the accused NSA leaker confessed to FBI agent, I screwed up royally. Meanwhile, your fact check. Labor conference decoding Corbyn's Brexit stance from BBC. The death tax talking point won't die. That's from fact check. Donald Trump largely accurate about drugs catapulted across the U.S.-Mexico border from PolitiFact. Did the Clinton Foundation donate $7.1 million to Antifa? You better head on over to Snopes for that. And fact checking Trump's claims from his speech on taxes. You get that from the Columbia Broadcasting System. That's your fact check because Alphabet Incorporated and all their alphabet agencies that they love to work with, know that you need to be told what to think. Let's dive into Holy Hexes and No last Saturday. As you may have noticed, the world did not end. However, we had a fantastic time on my wife's birthday, though. After September 23rd came and went without a rogue planet crashing into the Earth, some might think Christian numerologist David Mead would be out of the doomsday prediction biz. But lo and behold, the self-proclaimed researcher now says the end of the world is still on, It's just been moved to October. Meade predicted that a rogue planet named Nibiru would slam into Earth on September 23rd and bring about a global apocalypse. NASA had publicly debunked the Planet X conspiracy theory back in 2012, but it didn't stop the self-published author from writing and speaking about the doomsday prediction. Well, I guess they'll just have to change up some of the the internet rules so they can stop that self-published author from writing and speaking about their predictions. Now that that fateful Saturday has passed, Meade has reportedly revised his schedule for the planet's last day. Controversial doomsayer claims his September 23rd prediction was misinterpreted and that the world will actually end at some some point starting in October. Meade now believes the new date will begin a seven-year period of world-ending events, right? And then halfway through, something will stop. I've heard that story. That's when the action starts. Hold on and watch. Wait until the middle of October, and I don't believe you'll be disappointed... I I think no matter when it comes, I'll I'll probably be disappointed in any sort of planet-ending cataclysm. I I would find it kind of a bummer. Kind of a buzzkill. 
The former student of astronomy at the University of Louisville says his predictions come from deciphering codes in the Bible as well as other ancient markers like the Great Pyramids. Time will tell if Meade's new ominous prediction for around October 21st. Oh, damn, we're going to be in West Virginia. Gets watered down like he did with his last one. The conspiracy theorist admitted his day, admitted days before his September 23rd claim that people will probably still wake up on the 24th. The world's not ending, but the world as we know it is ending. A major part of the world will not be the same. The beginning of October, Meade confessed to the Washington Compost. Another prediction gone bad. Same exact thing that Harold Camping did. Remember, Harold Camping was the other guy who said the world's going to end here, the world's going to end there. And then when it didn't, he goes, oh, wait, I, I forgot to carry the one. Strange things always going on up here in the Pacific Northwest. And maybe much like my time in West Virginia, it's only when I left that I really realized how strange and how paranormal and how parapolitical it all was. I definitely have a greater sense of what's going on here in the Pacific Northwest, but I imagine that once I leave, I'll then even more realize how muddy it is up here. People are finding origami butterflies with ominous messages scattered on the ground throughout Seattle. The folded papers have a puzzling warning about safety, but no one seems to know who's behind the campaign or what it's about. When unfolded, the message, you are not safe, is revealed, and there's a date. 9 28 17. Hey, guess what? That's today, September 28th, 2017. The flip side has illustrations of Russell Wilson, Kurt Cobain, the Starbucks siren, and a message about peace. It could be a marketing gimmick for an artist or something. I don't know, says Henry Bridges, who found one of the papers in Capitol Hill, one of the cool sections of Seattle. They're also showing up in the U District, South Lake Union, downtown, and generating a lot of chatter on social media as people speculate about the motivation. I had some friends at Amazon say they're not going to go to work on the 28th, so Amazon, if people aren't showing up on the 28th, now you know why. Mark Shelfo, who also kept one of the papers, which he thinks started showing up this week. A website listed on one of the papers directs people to the same You Are Not Safe message, along with the 928 date. As more people around Seattle got wind of the messages, many speculated what they might mean. Someone on Facebook thought the messages were some sort of marketing effort for an insane clown co co posse concert. They're there today? Oh, ICP in Seattle. Whoop, whoop. Others said the messages were tied to a band in Michigan, which would also not exclude insane clown posse. Some tried to look into the website's source code to see who's hosting the site. Seattle police said on Wednesday afternoon that they did not believe that there was any safety concerns related to the origami, which they think might be part of an ad campaign of some sort. Origami butterflies with ominous message appear in Seattle parks. If somebody can do some follow-up and see if we learn anything about exactly what sort of marketing scheme this might be connected to. Maybe it's connected to the mysterious military surveillance plane that's been circling Seattle for weeks. And nobody knows why. For the past two weeks, Seattle residents have been witnessing a very strange occurrence day after day. Nondescript aircraft flying circles over the city, and the government hasn't fully explained why it's in the area. It's been identified as a CN-235, and its only marking is an Air Force serial number. What we do know about the aircraft is that it's decked out with highly advanced military surveillance equipment. The heavily modified USAF CASA CN-235-300 transport aircraft was outfitted with elaborate information-gathering hardware described in all of its apparent detail by a website called thedrive.com. The aircraft's call sign is Spud-21 and was in the air as recently as last Friday on one of its patrols. Its equipment includes microwave and ultra-high-frequency satellite communications gears, as well as a multitude of cutting-edge sensors. It's unmarked, save for the USAF serial on its tail, 66042. Spud-21 flies its mission out of Boeing Field, operating via Clay Lacey Aviation rather than Boeing's military ramp. Now, Boeing, of course, is one of the major corporations up here in the Pacific Northwest. That's the big secret about the Pacific Northwest. Oh, yeah, we're all free, fun-loving hippies that all work for Nike or Boeing or Intel or Microsoft. Then Boeing can throw a couple of hundred thousand dollars at some theaters and some art places, and they can get to write it off, and they look like Boeing supports the arts. According to the drive, it's equipped with tools that you wouldn't expect or probably want to find on a military aircraft circling a major U.S. city. Above all else, these types of surveillance systems are especially good at capturing and monitoring so-called patterns of life. 
over and around a target area. This is an especially useful tool when collecting intel on an enemy target or groups of targets over time and can open up new possibilities when it comes to the process of finding, fixing, and finishing the enemy. Though it has an Air Force serial number, it's been difficult to pin down which government agency is operating the plane. The drive contacted all the usual suspects, including NORTHCOM, Joint Task Force North, U.S. Air Force Special Commands, SOCOM, AFSOC, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. None of them would give a straight answer. Despite denying it initially, eventually AFSOC confessed to owning the plane and claimed that it was engaged in a training mission but they were tight-lipped about the rest of it. They would not elaborate or did not know what unit the aircraft belonged to or specifically exactly what type of training it was doing and who else was involved. At this point, training sounds like a pretty poor excuse. Circling Seattle. And we've seen these before. We've seen these many, many, many times, and it's not always during the exact events of 9-11. As it is, 9-11 a.m., Thursday, September 28th, as I come to you, I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, serving up the Holy Hexes edition of Your Morning Monarchy, as we continue to question and wonder what exactly is going on in Havana with those sonic attacks. So, good to see your faces back from UNGA. They're Air Force, because they intend on closing the air. Uh, 21 Americans have been medically confirmed as having been affected by incidents in Cuba. That number could change. Um, I've been very clear and very forthcoming with all of you. Uh, when those numbers have been changed and we've been able to medically confirm it, I brought it to you, um, or other representatives at the State Department have brought that to you. And so if that number changes, I will let you know. But as of now, it is 21. So is the humanitarian assistance included the UN sanctions? Uh, there was an executive order at the president's direction earlier on this year. And the State Department, along with DHS, sent uh, notes and had diplomatic engagements with every country around the globe. Uh, we told those countries our expectations about when, um, when they had someone who was applying for a visa here in the United States, the kind of documentation and the kind of information that would be needed in order to adjudicate a visa, in order for our, our consular affairs people to say, yes, you can come into the United States. Whatever. I'm just asking that my original question was, is it not correct that a the disproportionate number of people? We found at that time about 16 countries were not giving us the information that we required that our consular affairs officials could verify and then give somebody a visa and adjudicate a visa. 16 countries. Uh, 50 days later, eight of those countries came off this list. Eight of those countries came into compliance and they said, here you go, United States, here's the information that you need on behalf of our citizens so they can come. That's a story that's not being told. That's a story that's not being reported. Those eight countries fell into compliance. Eight other countries, however, did not. North Korea, some may say, well, why is North Korea on that list? Not a lot of North Koreans come to the United States. That is true. But here's the information we get from North Korea. Basically, zip. We, much, we want to get information. How much the request for information, disinformation to the North Koreans relayed to I, well, we, don't they, have, were, we don't have an embassy there, so I imagine. Did you ever actually even ask? I imagine North that Koreans that was done. I don't know for a fact how that was done with the instance of North Korea, but as you know, mm -hmm. we have various channels of communication through other governments uh, who could, who could so, raise our concerns. So if you've been listening to the Media Monarchy stream, you know that on certain days when the White House is doing their live press conferences, we carry the audio of that live. And of course, Add a little bit of music bed to it. They're generally a big WWF show of people acting like they're digging for the truth and people acting like they're telling you the truth. These State Department press conferences, I think in a lot of ways, are burying the lead. Now, the conversation gets off the rails there a little bit, and that's from a roughly RT clip, which means, I think, essentially a raw video. But we're trying to talk about the State Department, and that's Heather Newart, U.S. State Department spokesperson. 21 Americans affected by sonic attacks in Havana. Now, while well, we can all talk about sports ball and what people aren't doing with the right thing, politics and sports finally coming together in such a beautiful idiocracy kind of way, right? I don't know if we're in the running man or idiocracy or which terrible dystopic tragic comedy we're in. But we can all talk about football and what people sit down. And yeah, Sonic, you like the sink of the Sonic drive through attack? That's how we roll in media monarchy. Good catch there, Keith. <laughs> we can talk about football and who's not doing what with sports ball. Seems like the Trump train likes 
wild sensational stories, it kind of seems like we would be talking about the sonic attacks going on at the embassy in Cuba. We'll continue to try and follow this story, and again, if you get updates, you gotta come back to the cave and tell us what's up. You can hit it with the hashtag, or you can always, of course, reach out to me, james at mediamonarchy.com. Let's continue on with our Holy Hexes morning show. Six people injured after a noxious substance was thrown at a shopping center. 15-year-old boy has been arrested on suspicion of causing grievous bodily harm after the incident at the Stratford Center opposite Westfield in East London. Three of the victims needed hospital treatment after being hit by the substance during an altercation involving two groups of males shortly before 8 last Saturday. Six hurt in acid attack. Witnesses reported scenes of panic in the wake of the incident, with victims rushing to clean their wounds with water. Now, this situation does not actually look like terrorism per se, but they're immigrant kids from Somalia who are starting fights. Possibly just as deadly as an axe body spray attack, if it's a stinky teenager. Okay, now this is the point where it starts to get really dark, and this is the part where it starts to get really for adults only. So, put the kids away, or if you're not feeling the holy hexes, this is your warning and this is your part to check out. RT obtained video footage and a photograph taken during a police search of the home of the alleged cannibal couple in Russia, who have been detained on suspicion of killing a woman. According to media reports, the two have eaten up to 30 people. Media speculation on the couple being cannibals has not been confirmed by Russian law enforcement agencies. Police sources, however, have confirmed on condition of anonymity to the Repli, the aforementioned RT news agency, that the couple are indeed suspected of mass killings and cannibalism. Some really creepy news uh, from Russia's south. Police have detained what is alleged to be a cannibal family. Police told RT that two Krasnodar citizens are suspected of killing and eating up to 30 people. Uh, Roman Kasarov has a story. Two people, a husband and wife, were arrested on murder charges. They're accused of killing and dismembering the body of their drinking companion, a woman, on the 8th of September here in Krasnodar. However, the story is certainly tragic, but here's where the horror starts. Police sources told RT the pair could have killed and eaten as many as 30 people. Here's a comment from the investigative committee. These people have been detained. The court ordered that they be remanded in custody. A number of forensic examinations have been requested. During the preliminary investigation, incoming information and versions of events pertaining to the suspect's possible participation in other crimes in the region will be verified. The chilly details emerged when construction workers found a telephone allegedly belonging to the uh, suspect. Now, the workers saw petrifying images of a man posing with a bloody dismembered body and uh, alerted the police who launched an investigation immediately. Now, the authorities searched the home of the accused uh, uh, couple where they made even more shocking discoveries. And those were body parts and some kind of a salty solution, uh, food fragments and unspecified frozen meat and experts will now determine whether these are human or not and also they found uh, body parts of the victim in the basement of the building now at the moment the investigative committee team and uh, top experts are trying to determine whether the couple under arrest is connected to any other crimes whatsoever now we spoke to people who knew the couple for the last few years I didn't notice anything weird about them. They were polite. He was a construction worker and his wife had been a nurse, but she'd lost her job and drank a lot. The news came as a shock to me. I never had a clue what was going on. The investigation is ongoing, but there is a suspicion that the couple have allegedly been killing and eating their victims for the last 20 years. Now, all this remains to be confirmed, so watch this space as we bring you more details as they emerge. And again, everything we say and play will always be included in the show notes. We got reports from RT as well from the New York Post, which always loves a salacious tabloid story. Once in custody, the man admitted that he and his wife had been practicing cannibalism for the past two decades. The other trending stories on page six of the New York Post is the musical question, what will happen to Hugh Hefner's Playboy Mansion now? We'll have to look at that question some other day. It's Holy Hexes Day, and as we now head off to the land of the Flaming Lips, Norman, Oklahoma. 
where attorneys for Alton Nolan said Monday that he was insane when he beheaded a co-worker at an Oklahoma food processing plant days after prosecutors played recordings of him calmly admitting to the killing. Nolan, 32, is charged with first-degree murder of Colleen Hufford in September 2014 at a Vaughn Foods plant in Norman. The killing made national headlines because, aside from its gruesome nature, Nolan, who is black, had converted to Islam and Hufford, 54, was a white woman. Nolan allegedly killed Hufford in retaliation for being suspended when she complained about racial remarks he made while the two were on the assembly line. Nolan allegedly told her, I beat Caucasians. Prosecutors called their final witnesses on Wednesday in the trial recessed for the following two days. In recordings played for the jury, last Wednesday, Nolan is heard telling police investigators that the killing was justified because he felt oppressed as a Muslim. Quote, she just, you know, wanted to bring me down like I couldn't be me as a Muslim. She wanted to bring me down low to the ground, end quote. Nolan admitted that he had watched videos on YouTube depicting beheadings all the time. Nolan denied investigators' questions over whether he was influenced by Muslims he knew from mosques or that he met in prison. Like I say, the Quran is easy to understand. No one guides me but Allah. Nolan said he felt no remorse for the attack. Quote, I don't feel regret because what I done. That's probably going to make Von Foods a better place to work at. If somebody was to come there who was a Muslim, I don't regret it at all. Nolan said he was sure he was going to heaven if he had died during the killing. He was shot and wounded by a company executive, stopping a subsequent attack on Tracy Johnson, age 46. He wouldn't stop, Johnson testified on September 18th. He was just going back and forth like he was cutting up a piece of meat. I didn't know what to do or think. Johnson testified that she needed surgery to repair damage to her jugular vein. She sustained severe cuts to her face, neck, and finger. But he was just insane. He was just crazy. We love our Somalis. We love our Muslims. Oh, they're so cute. Oh, they're so sweet. A Tennessee sheriff's office is asking people not to call the agency about a body trapped under a closed, blood-stained garage door. That's because the scene at home in Greene County, Tennessee, isn't real. It's an early Halloween display. The Greene County Sheriff's Department says it's been inundated with so many calls about the lifelike display that it posted a message Wednesday on the agency's Facebook page to let people know it's not real. Do not call 911 reporting a dead body, says the post, which includes a photo. Instead, congratulate the homeowner on a great display. Homeowner Joseph Lovergive told WJHL-TV that his family loves Halloween and always decorates early. He said deputies who responded to the first call took the boot off the stuffed clothing to make sure it wasn't real. And this story has been floating around for several days, and that's quite the possibility for our album art today. On this Holy Hexes edition of Your Morning Monarchy, it is Thursday, September 28th, 2017. Streaming live, as always, from MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. There's been a shooting in Antioch. And we keep the creepy in Tennessee. The shooter was wearing a clown mask, according to some, or a neoprene ski mask in another report. A 911 caller said it was a clown mask. Police said rumors the gunman was wearing a clown mask do not appear to be true. The mask was more like what you would see on a skier. At least one person, woman, was killed and seven others had been injured at the Burnett Chapel Church of Christ shooting in Antioch, Tennessee. The shooter shot himself and is being treated at the hospital. Another person was pistol whipped and has been taken to the hospital. More on that in just a second. All of the wounded had been taken to area hospitals. The fire department said they were all majority adults. All of the wounded except for one was over the age of 60. The suspect, 25-year-old Emmanuel Kadega Sampson, immigrated from Sudan two decades ago, police said. He's suspected of bringing two pistols and a mask to the predominantly white Burnett Chapel Church of Christ in Antioch, southeast of Nashville, before opening fire just after 11 a.m. The church, which has a weekly 10 a.m. service, is located at 3890 Pin Hook Road. It's not clear what kind of mask he wore. All kinds of neoprene masks exist, and our friend Lauren Coleman, of course, includes possibilities of those masks on his post on CopycatEffect.com. The shooting in Rockford, Washington State, just back on September 13th. That's essentially what they're calling the Spokane shooting. At the Freedom High School was allegedly done by Caleb Sharp, who portrayed himself on Facebook as the Joker. I understand that, uh, that there are eight people that have been shot, including the shooter. Uh, word that I received a few moments ago uh, and uh, needs to be confirmed, but I understand the man just walked in, sat down, and started shooting. So uh, 
that's basically all I know. I've been trying to get in myself to see exactly what's going on, but that's 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 what I've been told. You said you you got the call from your son. Was he in the church? No, he was. Uh, he he knew somebody that was. Sir, you said that you heard the pastor and his wife were among those. Yes, that's. I heard that the minister and, and his wife were among those that were shot. That's that's what I heard. But once again, I I, I, I can't confirm that. And what are their names? And Joey Spann is the preacher, and I don't know his wife's name. Have you been told what kind of condition they're in? No, I have not. But I understand that they that most of those that were shot were still in the building a few minutes ago. Now I haven't saw any ambulance leave, so I don't know. I don't know whether medical personnel are dealing with them here or what. It's kind of your reaction when you got this got that call. I'm just absolutely stunned. I can't uh, I just can't believe that somebody would come in off the street and start shooting but that seems to be what happened. A 22-year-old with a concealed carry license stopped a shooter at a Tennessee church after being pistol whipped in the face. Robert Engel, physically engaged shooting suspect Emmanuel K. Sampson on Sunday, stopping a rampage that already killed one and wounded seven others. So said Nashville Police Chief Steve Anderson during a press conference, quote, he's the hero. He's the person who stopped this madness. Samson allegedly entered Burnett Ch at Chapel Church, as we'd already told you. Engel, who apparently did not have his concealed weapon with him inside the church, confronted the shooter and was subsequently beaten with a pistol. During the fight, the shooter gets shot in the chest with his own gun. Engel then went to his car, got his concealed weapon, and returned to the church and held the dude and wait for the cops to come. So he is the hero. Sometimes the hero does heroic things by getting punched and beaten in the face while other things happen. Yes, this is what your holy hexes on your morning monarchy is like. It is the underbelly all around America. Meanwhile, let's leave Tennessee and head up to Idaho, shall we? Where they are ranking number one in the worst for faith healing deaths. More children die due to faith-based medical negligence in Idaho than any other state. And today, advocates for children discussed ways to develop legislation to change that. Rita Swan, national expert and founder of the group Children's Healthcare is a Legal Duty, also known as CHILD, was in Boise today. She discussed the GEM State's ranking as the worst in the nation in faith healing deaths. Before Idaho had even become a state, the territory enacted a law requiring parents to provide necessary food, clothing, shelter, and medical attendance to their child. But religious exemptions were added to the law in 1972. Swan hopes Idaho legislators will stop talking about the issue and make some real changes to the law in the upcoming session. So not so good up in oh, Idaho. So However, hey, hey, forecast. hey, with your, your autoplay videos, knock it off. Six on my side. Jumping back to the previous story, you guys were speculating, oh, that's why the story about the Antioch, Tennessee shooting went away, because it involved someone else actually stepping up and taking action. And they don't like to hear those stories in the news. They'd like to hear people going, well, I waited on the floor and cried and waited like a baby until the state came to save me, which, of course, they won't and don't. You know who might come and save you, though? A trio of Bible-toting teenage girls seeking to take the spiritual world by storm with their unique brand of exorcism. Hailing from Phoenix, Arizona, 18-year-old exorcist Bryn and her two friends, the Schirkenbach sisters caught up with, of course, Vice News to explain how it all works, but I'm getting this article from HelloChristian.com. Satan can't just randomly go into anybody he wants to. He has to have a legal right. And so what happens is, it's like a little umbrella, and when you step out from under the umbrella of God's protection when you sin. For example, if you start doing drugs, you're out from that umbrella of God's protection, and Satan's got you. So many times we've dealt with men who've gone to prostitutes, and they've gotten demons. Just like you can get a sexually transmitted disease, you can get a sexually transmitted demon. Somebody please immediately take that and make it a band name. You can't make this stuff up. And we appreciate you being here listening on the chat. You're about halfway through the episode. I know some of you might have to take off and do other things. We appreciate you. We will be streaming live. And, of course, these episodes will go up on the stream. And we've been putting each and every episode of not only your morning show, but also your daily DJ set at noon. Morning Monarchy and Pump Up the Volume going up on BitChute each and every day. 
Four more women have spoken out with allegations of sexual assault or harassment against Ain't It Cool News founder Harry Knowles. After IndieWire posted a story last week in which an Austin-area woman came forward with stories of sexual assault in the early aughts, other women took to social media to share similar allegations. In the wake of the allegations against the Ain't It Cool News founder, as we've said, more have spoken up. Are y'all familiar with Ain't It Cool News? They were an early website looking at early film pop culture production. And because of where he was in Austin and who he knew, he got lots of early stories about production and, and, and you know, set shots and cool movie nerd things like that. He's not perhaps the most attractive person you might think of. Not unlike comic book guy from The Simpsons. Meanwhile, a former Blue Springs doctor and Boy Scout leader was jailed Monday after pleading guilty to sexually assaulting a teenage boy, Joseph T. Mackey, 45, of Lee's Summit. Pleaded guilty in Jackson County Circuit Court to statutory sodomy. Mackey was taken into custody and ordered held without bond. His sentencing is scheduled for November 3rd. According to court records, the victim told investigators that he met Mackey through a scouting activity when he was 11 years old. That's happening out of Kansas City. And that means, yes, we've gotten into hashtag pedogate. Staff of former Prime Minister Edward Heath have been asked whether he smuggled children in and out of Downing Street while he was in power. The ex-Tory leader's former staff was questioned as part of an inquiry into child abuse allegations made against former British Prime Minister Edward Heath. Not just some random guy, not just some jerkass that works for the Boy Scouts, not some crazy monster that works for kids shows for the BBC either. You leave a little higher up. The inquiry is understood to have questioned whether or not it was feasible that the former conservative leader smuggled children into number 10. Heath's principal, private secretary, Lord Armstrong of Ilminster, who was among those interviewed, said, according to the Times, if there is one place where slipping in and out is not easy, it is number 10 Downing Street. Detectives also sought to discover whether Heath, who, of course, fortunately for him, died in 2005 at the age of 89, had left any wills in an attempt to uncover any suspicious legacy, but none was found. Armstrong, one of Heath's closest advisor, and who has previously said the Prime Minister was completely asexual, accused Wiltshire police of undertaking a fishing expedition and has called for an independent review of the inquiry's findings. Many allegations made against Heath, who was Britain's leader between 1970 and 1974, have been doubted, especially those from an accuser known only as Nick, who has been labeled a fantasist. Reports have emerged that at least one person will be charged for wasting police time. It sparked accusations against police that they're wasting $2 million on a fantasy. A summary of findings due next week, however, is likely to support the opening of the two-year probe into the Tory politician looking at allegations of abuse spanning five decades. According to the report, the summary expected to be published on October 5th will likely say the police gathered enough evidence to interview Heath under caution had he still been alive, as detectives working as part of Operation Conifer have credible testimonies from seven complainants. And one of the men who helped expose all of this, John DeCamp, former Nebraska state senator, veteran, and attorney, has died. He served in the U.S. military in Vietnam, and in 1975, he initiated Operation Baby Lift, which evacuated more than 2,800 orphaned Vietnamese children into safety. John DeCamp wrote a book, The Franklin Cover-Up, Child Abuse, Satanism, and Murder in Nebraska, based on the infamous teen prostitution ring originating out of Boys Town in Lincoln, Nebraska, that of course was linked to the White House in the late 1980s. He represented the young victims in the case that spurred a grand jury investigation into the disturbing and brutal pedophilia scandal that ruined many lives. You know the cover of the Washington Times, Thursday, June 19th, 1989. Front page, massive font. Homosexual prostitution inquiry ensnares VIPs with Reagan and Bush. And if you've never seen it, the legendary Conspiracy of Silence. The documentary that chronicles John DeCamp's investigation, scheduled to air on the Discovery Channel back in 1994. It was even in the TV guide at the time. But they pulled it at the last minute, and it only exists thanks to the webs. We got that latest episode of New World Next Week, which just published just a couple of hours ago. I'll tell you about that in just a few minutes. But one of the stories we do briefly mention is the unprecedented step 
for a country where a sprawling monarchy has managed to cling to power in part because of its concessions to hardline conservative clerics, Saudi Arabia announced yesterday that its King Salman has issued a historic decree, a royal decree, granting driving licenses for women in the kingdom. Segregated and secretive, Saudi women lead very different lives to men. Until now, they've been forbidden by law to drive. Last night, that changed. The country's aging King Salman issued a decree. From June next year, women can finally take to the roads. For Saudi Arabia, this is huge. I'm very, very happy. I haven't slept since yesterday because of how happy I am. We have waited for years for this to happen. This will help us depend on ourselves and not need anyone to take us. We will not need drivers anymore. Every woman will be free and independent. The lifting of the ban will have an economic impact. An estimated 800,000 imported chauffeurs work in Saudi Arabia, costing families up to a third of their budget. In the past, some women have tried flouting the law, driving illegally to demand their rights ending with arrest and imprisonment. One of those activists was Manal al-Sharif. She even had to leave the country. I was targeted uh, by a campaign that shaming me. I lost my job, I lost my child custody, and I had to leave my country eventually. Um, I still go and come, but I was harassed so much, especially my family, my mother and my father. My father was sitting in a, a mosque listening to a mom calling me a whore for driving my car. The long-standing opposition to Saudi women driving has come from religious clerics rather than ruling princes. They fear it will lead to a breakdown in morals and illicit affairs outside marriage. But their views have been overruled by the man on the left, the powerful Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. This is all part of his Vision 2030 plan to modernize Saudi Arabia. For now, the clerics have been largely silent. The lifting of the driving ban on women appears to be irreversible. Agenda 2030 rolls on just in time for driverless cars to make, of course, humans driving, period, will will probably be illegal. And the good note sidebar made in the chat, hopping back a story, Trine Day Books, Trine Day Publishing, T-R-I-N-E, run by Chris Milligan up here in the Pacific Northwest, is a fantastic location for a lot of great books, not the least of which on the Franklin scandal. Now, as long as we're talking about driving... Anthony Lewandowski is many things to many different people. Brilliant engineer, serial entrepreneur, ruthless businessman, trade secret thief. That last one's just alleged. But now, thanks to an extensive profile in Back Channel, we can add another category to Lewandowski's long resume, church founder. Lewandowski, the multimillionaire who's at the center of an ongoing legal battle between Alphabet and Uber over autonomous driving technology, recently filed paperwork to create a religious organization called Way of the Future. According to Wired, the purpose is to develop and promote the realization of a godhead based on artificial intelligence. Unsurprisingly, Lewandowski is a big believer in the singularity, meaning he is a transhumanist nutjob. Anthony Lewandowski's uber-fired self-driving car engineer has founded his own church. And this should not be surprising at all. Maybe he wants to make a little bit of a getaway. Greg Laurie, senior pastor of Harvest Christian Fellowship in Riverside, Irvine, California, encountered a number of surprising details while researching legendary actor Steve McQueen's life story, including the entertainer's conversion to the Christian faith. But perhaps most shocking detail was McQueen's eerily close encounter with Charles Manson and his cult. Steve McQueen was invited to the home of Sharon Tate and was on his way over to the party when he met some chick and ran off with her instead. Pastor Laurie recently told the Billy Hallowell podcast, and that was the night the Manson family struck and Steve surely would have been killed. Now Greg Laurie has made a documentary about Steve McQueen. It's called Steve McQueen, American Icon, but what is the through line? is Steve McQueen's religious quest. He says of that night that Steve McQueen missed out on being a victim of the Manson family. God spared McQueen. Steve McQueen set the action movie template for the modern day era of cinema. He's singular. And he was the best at what he did. He was the best Steve McQueen there was. He 
did have beautiful blue eyes. They were sad eyes. Well, like most people, I've always been a fan of Steve McQueen. Everybody knows he became a big movie star. What some may not know is he was the number one movie star in the world, 2017. He's still an icon, but here's what people don't know about Steve McQueen. The trajectory of his life. He had global fame. He was a heavy drug user, a heavy drinker, and there was a big old hole in Steve McQueen's heart. At a certain point, he disconnected from Hollywood and literally walked away. He didn't want Hollywood anymore. He wanted something else. He was trying to find a life of peace. And a very ordinary man that entered his life that was the perfect person to tell Steve McQueen the answer to the questions he had had from his earliest childhood. And here's the story I want to tell. Steve McQueen became a believer in Jesus Christ toward the end of his life. That is a story very few people know. And that is a story I want to tell in this documentary film. And I'm going to follow Steve's life. And it's going to be a story like people have never seen before. movie trailer now someone in the chat actually claims steve mcqueen was on the manson family hit list which is why he carried a gun with him all the time we'll have to talk about that in further detail a little bit later but of course we're talking about laurel canyon talking about the drug world talking about the music biz talking about the process church and manson well then we're just right a handshake away from scientology invoking four-letter words in public is part of a church practice that involves reading the tone scale, according to a former Scientologist and friend. As an expert, cursing in Scientology is almost a sacrament. Before it even began, it was clear that Elizabeth Moss's Emmy speech was not your typical award show chatter, to the shock, the mild shock of many in the Microsoft theater. The Handmaid's Tale star, 35, uttered an audible fuck. As she approached the microphone to accept the award later in the speech, Moss drew nervous laughter as she addressed her mother Linda in the office saying, audience saying, quote, You are brave and strong and smart. You have taught me that you can be kind and a fucking badass. Elizabeth Moss. And my mother, <laughs> you are brave and strong. Elizabeth Moss was so shocked and flustered by her win during the 2017 Primetime Emmy Awards, she wound up saying the F word twice. Moss won the Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Drama Series for her work on the Hulu drama The Handmaid's Tale. She opened her acceptance speech with an F-bomb that seemed to convey her shock and excitement for winning. She went on to thank Hulu, the show's writers, directors, and cast, and then thanked her mother, saying, You are brave and strong and smart, and you've taught me that you can be kind and a bleeping badass. Yep, saying the F-word is still new sometimes. On September 15th, the Trump administration nominated former criminal investigator and federal law enforcement officers association president John Adler as the Department of Justice's director of the Bureau of Justice Assistant. Assistance. In that role, Adler will not only help set national criminal justice policy, he'll also oversee all relevant state and local grant programs. Judging by one of Adler's initiatives, this should make the Church of Scientology very, very happy. That's because in addition to his official role at FLEOA, Adler spent a number of years on the advisory board of the Heroes Health Fund, a group that purports to offer support for firefighters, police, EMTs, veterans, and others harmed by toxic exposures in the line of duty using a detoxification program developed by Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard. Trump's DOJ nominee pushes Scientology-based detox program. As we start to wrap up this episode and we transition from holy hexes into the media memes from Charles Manson to L. Ron Hubbard, Noisy has a look at cult-made music from the extremely average to the batshit insane. Number five on the list, David Koresh. Number four, Jim Jones and the People Temple Choir. Number three, Charles Manson. Number two, Father Yod. And we've talked about Father Yod. He's got whole compilations put out on the indie rock label Drag City, making him label mates with bands like Stereolab, Gaster Del Sol. Number one on Noisy's list of the best cult music, L. Ron Hubbard, 
apparently made a free jazz album called Power of Source. Back in the late 70s, early 80s. We might have to take a listen to that. But as we do wrap up this episode, we'll head off and do one last movie trailer. An Egyptian ultra-conservative Muslim preacher hears on his car radio news of the death of Michael Jackson, the pop singer he idolized in his teens, and he becomes so distraught, he crashes his car. The news of the passing of the King of Pop is the start of a crisis of conscience for Sheikh Khalid Hani, the main character of the movie Sheikh Jackson, Egypt's first feature film to focus on the religious movement known as Salafis, followers of one of strictest interpretations of Islam. Yeah, right. Well, I guess since this is all in Egyptian, probably not a lot of you are picking up too much from this trailer for Sheikh Jackson, which I think did really well at the Venice Film Festival, and it will probably be Egypt's nomination for Best Picture Oscar. That's how that works for the Best Picture Oscars. Essentially, a country has to say, this is the movie we want you to consider. This is our official... It's the word. Um, it's their submission. Their official submission from Egypt this year will probably be Sheikh Jackson. Sorry, Sheikh Jackson. I am for real. There's your Holy Hexes headlines, my friends. Super crazy, super scary. Hashtag Holy Hexes. Everything we say in play, of course, included in the show notes. And just like every other day, if you want to know about all the other food world order recalls and all those stories, follow that hashtag. If you want to hear a bunch of crazy or other stories of murder and mayhem, I dare you to check out hashtag Holy Hexes. Also want to remind you, the latest episode of New World Next Week has been published just a couple of hours ago from my buddy James Corbett, the long-running series between ourselves. Barack Obama now selling himself on Wall Street. That's right, it took him less than a year to go running back to Cantor Fitzgerald and all the other gangster banksters. We've also got some story about the Saudis. We've also got the stories about the Chinese and all the other geopolitical stories that you hear before they become massive news on that latest episode of New World Next Week. I'll play the audio from that a little bit later today on your Media Monarchy stream, as I've also got your fourth of five brand new songs from Portland artists this week. We've got Probably Not coming up in just a few minutes, but let's take a look at this day in history. September 28th, 1912, Corporal Frank S. Scott of the United States Army becomes the first enlisted man to die in an airplane crash. He and pilot... Pilot Rockwell crashed at College Park, Maryland. September 28th, 1918, the flu epidemic hits Philadelphia. That would be the 1918 flu. And in 1919, on this day, race riots begin in Omaha, Nebraska. They're essentially referred to as the race riots of 1919. In the late 1800s, Omaha, Nebraska was a booming western city that was soon to become number one in the world in livestock meat production. In the early 1900s, Nearly 80% of Omaha's population of an estimated 125,000 people had livestock-related jobs. These workers were primarily of European descent. And from 1910 to 1919, their participation in labor strikes and the First World War left many vacancies at the meat packaging plants. To fill the void, company owners vigorously recruited blacks in the southern states. There were ads in papers in Omaha and throughout the South that beckoned blacks to come north to better wages and living conditions. The wages that blacks were paid at the Omaha plants were lower than white workers, but it was significantly more money than they could earn in the South. Hundreds of blacks began to replace white plant workers, and by 1915, a burgeoning black community was established near the meat packaging plants in South Omaha and the near north side of the city. 
A new African-American newspaper called The Monitor began circulation in the summer of 1915. The Monitor was published weekly with news stories, columns, and advertising that was vital to establishing a strong sense of community among blacks in Omaha. By 1920, over 10,000 African-Americans were living in Omaha. Because of the rapid growth in the African-American population and employment situations at the meat packaging plants, racial tension began to build in Omaha. This tension culminated in the summer of 1919 when one plant worker in particular met a horrible fate. This was the period of red hot summer. This was the period where about that what it is, you'd already had the riots in St. Louis, other places. And now you have them in, in Omaha, what happened was they, they had a woman say that she had been uh, molested or had been sexually uh, abused by a black man. And that's all that needed to be said. On September 25th, 1919, Agnes Lobeck identified 40-year-old Will Brown as the man who attacked her. Brown was then arrested and taken to the Douglas County Courthouse. Before Brown was even identified, a civic storm was already brewing in Omaha due to a series of inflammatory stories published in the Omaha Bee and struggles for political power between racketeer Thomas Dennison and Omaha's mayor, Edward Smith. What's interesting is, is that the mayor attempted to keep them from taking Will Brown out of jail. And he suffered from an inch of his life, of his life being taken from him. And that was really the intent from the very beginning, to, to, to really kill him, as well as to bring about the, uh, the racial tension even more so. On the evening of September 28, 1919, a crowd of an estimated 5,000 to 10,000 people gathered outside the Douglas County Courthouse and demanded that Brown be handed over to them. Inside the courthouse, a frightened judge and other prisoners sent a note down to the crowd, saying that they would surrender Brown. The bloodthirsty crowd could not wait and rushed into the courthouse to seize Brown. Once in the hands of the crowd, Brown was beaten, hung from a lamppost, and shot more than 100 times. Actor Henry Fonda, at the time just 14 years old, witnessed the horrendous event from a second-story window at his father's printing company across the street from the courthouse. The ghastly melee ended with the burning of Will Brown's body. An Omaha World Herald photographer captured one of the most infamous photographs in American history. After the riot, federal troops were called in and for two days, Omaha was under martial law. Even though over 100 people were arrested in connection with the riot and the murder of Will Brown, no one was charged. For Omaha's black community, an editorial picture published in the Monitor spoke volumes. Will Brown was buried in 1919 in an unmarked grave in Powders Field at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Omaha. 90 years later, in July of 2009, a man from Riverside, California, Chris Abair, who has no ties to the city of Omaha and has never visited before, was moved to pay $450 of his own money for a marker for Will Brown's grave. Abair said that he watched a special on actor Henry Fonda, which mentioned the riot and how it affected his life and his acting career. Abair also said that he hopes people will stop by the headstone and reflect on what happened to Will Brown in 1919 so that we may never let ourselves sink again to this level of inhumanity. The race riots of Omaha on this day in 1919 past is prologue with a cameo appearance from Henry Fonda. Continuing to look at this day in history, September 28, 1928, Sir Alexander Fleming notices a bacteria-killing mold growing in his lab, discovering penicillin. 1941, Ted Williams becomes the last player to hit 400. 1951, CBS makes the first color television available for sale to the general public, discontinued a month later. September 28, 1958, To Know Him Is To Love Him by The Teddy Bears was released. The song was written and composed by an 18-year-old Phil Spector. 1971, the Parliament of the United Kingdom passes the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, banning the medicinal use of cannabis. 
1973, the ITT building in New York City is bombed in protest at ITT's alleged involvement in the 9-11-73 coup d'etat in Chile. 1975, the Spaghetti House siege in which nine people are taken hostage takes place in London on this day. 1976, A&M Records sues George Harrison for failing to deliver his LP 33 and a third on time. 1986, the Democratic Progressive Party was established under the martial law in Taiwan, becoming the first opposition party in Taiwan. On this day in 1991, SAC, that's Strategic Air Command, stands down from alert all ICBMs scheduled for deactivation under START-1, as well as its Strategic Bomber Force. September 28, 1991, that same day, three events, Miles Davis died on this day. And also, Garth Brooks' album Rope in the Wind became the first country album to debut at number one on the pop charts. 1995 on this day, Bobby Brown's car riddled with bullets in Boston's Roxbury section. Gun battle killed his sister's fiancé. September 28, 2000, the Al-Aqsa Intifada. Ariel Sharon visits the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Dome of the Rock, known to Jews as the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. 2001, on this day, Courtney Love files a claim against Geffen Records and two musicians from her late husband's band, Nirvana. The suit was aimed at invalidating a 1997 agreement over the group's body of work. Love claimed that she signed the deal while she was distressed. In September 28, 2008, SpaceX launches the first private spacecraft, Falcon 1, into orbit on this day. Published to my own website a decade ago today, Congress and Senate Kill Persians and Amendments, Woman's 9-11 Survival Story Questioned, Alabama City Reopening Fallout Shelters, Ron Paul in the PBS Debate, and Chicago Video Surveillance Gets Smarter. Celebrating birthdays today on September 28th, the founder of the Columbia Broadcasting System, William S. Paley. Also comics illustrator Al Catborn on this day, American spy Ethel Rosenberg. And he was as mad as hell. Peter Finch, born on this day in 1916. It's also Jerry Clower's birthday, Bridget Bardot, Ben E. King, and John Sayles. John Sayles, yeah, sure, he, you know, wrote and made movies like Piranha, but he also wrote and made movies like Matewan. It's also Mira Sorvino's birthday, Moon Zappa, Naomi Watts, Joseph Arthur, Dita Von Teese, and St. Vincent. Some of those more weird folks might weasel their way into our daily DJ set at noon, which happens at noon Pacific time right here. You're soaking in it. MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. And for our fourth day this week, we go out with independent music from right here in Portland. Today, probably not. I thought I was the only one that used the word probably. P-R-O-L-L-Y. If you've been in the chat, you've, chat, you've seen me use that. Probably not K-N-O-T is the indie artist. Their new record, It's Not Anymore, comes out next month, and we're going to listen to a song called Perennial by Probably Not to wrap up this episode. This was the Holy Hexes edition of Your Morning Monarchy for Thursday, September 28th, 2017, and I am James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com again, thanking you so much for listening and supporting our work. And reminding you, as always, like Jalabi Offer says, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care.
You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.